Well, I'd ask that you open your Bibles to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, we have been making our way through this gospel chapter by chapter, verse by verse. So if you're visiting with us this morning, uh, you are dropping into a five-year-long venture. And we are continuing in this wonderful section. Last time we laid the foundation in verses 13 through 21 with that critical injunction to get an eternal perspective. It was a section on using your life well for the sake of the kingdom, of course, for the sake of Christ. We have been entrusted by a loan from God, as we saw, called our lives. And so when he calls back that loan, he will expect a return. And so in verses 22 through 34, Jesus now turns to the very important issue of fear, worry, and anxiety. In fact, that is the title of my sermon this morning, Getting a Grip on Fear, Worry, and Anxiety. In fact, it is that crippling propensity for why so many in the Christian life are stunted, stunted for their usefulness for kingdom purposes. And so Jesus here this morning has some words for us. These are words of instruction, but also I think tremendous words of comfort. This is a section on what to do in the face of worry, the face of anxiety, the face of even fear. And so let us just begin here this morning by reading this passage. This is a passage actually which goes all the way through verse 48. Uh, The more immediate section is 22 through 34, uh, and then even within that we're only going to be in verses 23 through 26 for this morning. But let me just begin our time here by reading these very helpful words of our Lord. And I'm going to read up through verse 34 just to get some of the context into our minds. But beginning in verse 22 of Luke chapter 12, here's what Luke the physician records under the inspiration of the Spirit. He writes, And he, Jesus, said to his disciples, For this reason I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, nor for your body as to what you will put on. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. So consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, they have no storeroom nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life's span? If then you cannot do even a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? And consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, but I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. So if God so clothes the grass in the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, O you men of little faith? So do not seek what you will eat and what you will drink, and do not keep worrying. For all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek. But your Father knows what you need, and He knows you need these things. So seek His kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. So sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourselves money belts which do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Without giving it any thought, I can say with some pretty good confidence that apart from probably the issue of marriage, the issue of parenting, probably the singular issue that I deal with more in ministry is that issue of fear, worry, and anxiety in the Christian life. In fact, all three of those are pretty interconnected issues and therefore tend to work in tandem. And so if you have to deal with one, you just typically deal with all of them. And so in many ways, this is really just a single issue. And there are few things that are more crippling to a person's life than anxiety. Few things more crippling in this culture, frankly, to most people. You don't have to be in pastoral ministry to see how this issue can utterly dominate a person how this issue can cause them to lose total control and even paralyze them in some, some of the most profound of ways. There are a few things more self-destructive to a life than one who is controlled by worry. In fact, I have seen some people endure some of the most difficult things. 
endure what should be probably the most crippling things in life, but I've seen them endure it well, endure it faithfully, endure it fruitfully. And because regardless the circumstance, regardless the news, regardless the diagnosis, they were not controlled by a fear of the unknown and therefore worry and anxiety. And yet I have seen others completely controlled and subsequently self-destruct on what should be, frankly, relatively minor issues, but because they were controlled by a fear of the unknown and therefore worry and anxiety. And we live in an age now, victimism and, of course, pseudoscience, many of the soft sciences, agenda-driven hard sciences that cause a vast majority of people to bite the bait of some very insidious lies which, of course, doesn't help at all in people's tendency toward fear, worry, and anxiety. In fact, we live in the wealthiest and most educated and most advanced society, scientifically, medically, technologically, that any generation has ever known. We're also the most medicated, psychologized, therapeuticized generation that the world has ever known. And yet, without question, we are also the most anxious and depressed and fearful, and suicidal, and self-destructive generation that this world has ever known. Something is wrong. In fact, that should be testifying to this generation that we are no closer actually to solving anything, despite the pride and the arrogance that we somehow know better. In fact, if anything, we're moving backwards these issues are on the consistent rise in this world, statistically. And so despite our many so-called advances, the fact is anxiety, depression, fear, worry, panic only keeps on increasing statistically in our day. And to be honest, I understand that. I understand that this world is stressed. I understand that people are anxious. I understand that people are stressed and living in a perpetual state of fear. And because, as I said before, it should be. In fact, it's strange if it's not. If your worldview is that you're just a ball of atoms in energy and material stuck on an untethered rock, just sort of floating through space, hurling itself along and ready to be swallowed up, frankly, by a giant ball of gas and fire called the sun at any moment, and all of it because 13.8 billion years ago, nothingness that had no space, no energy, and no material blew up by no cause because there was not yet time, space, or substance, which also means that there's no actual meaning, purpose, or goal because nothing's in control and there's no point to any of it. You should be in some profound anxiety. In fact, that, if that is your worldview, then... No wonder why so many are just trying to numb themselves. There's just a massive cosmic fear sourced from a profound set of unknowns. And that is people's world. Nobody's in control. Nothing is in control. I know why people go to drugs. I know why people go to drinking. I know why people go on shopping sprees and eating binges. This is an anxious world. This is an anxious world living in tremendous fear of everything that is unknown about tomorrow. And so we come this morning to, a, I think, a wonderful passage addressing from a biblical perspective the true nature of fear and worry. In fact, the word worry is used here four times in this passage, and the word fear, you'll notice, is used down in verse 32, which Lord willing, we're going to take a look at it next time, but that there is the word phobeo, from which we get phobia or fear. But all of it sits in stark contrast in this passage to another very important issue, and that is in verse 28, that very critical issue of a true faith. True faith. In fact, that is what sits at the center of this passage and is therefore the central point, where again, faith is simply a word in the Bible that means to trust means to rest in a set of truths. Of course, in the context, to trust in that which is actually true. When we talk in 
The Christian life about faith, we by no means are talking about some kind of blind faith. Rather, we are talking about having confidence in that which is ultimate reality, that which is ultimate and absolute truth. In fact, the same words of fear and faith were contrasted back in chapter 8 and verse 25 when Jesus stilled the storm. You might remember that. That was the great contrast in that passage. We saw it again in chapter 10 and verse 41 where Jesus calls out the anxiety of Martha. You might remember that. This is an issue Jesus is very concerned about. In fact, the term there in the passage of Martha was not the word for fear, but the Greek term for anxiety, the term uh, merimanao, which uh, is the word that is used here in this passage four times. In fact, you'll remember there in chapter 10 that Martha was unbelievably anxious and fretting, was she not? While Mary, on the other hand, was literally sitting at the Lord's feet in perfect contentment perfect ease, perfect joy, fretless, anxiousless, fearless. And why? Well, because she was described there as feasting upon the words of Christ. Her food was the word of God, Jesus said. And so she was captivated, as you might remember that key word there, but she was literally consumed by truth, but because she had consumed the truth, it was the word of God or the words of Christ that were captivating her mind and, of course, her heart which, by the way, showed us that the key to battling anxiety, again, is always truth. It involved the mind. It involves right thinking. It is something that involves trust in that which is actually true, as opposed, of course, to believing falsehoods or living in a state of unknowns and just grasping at what may or may not be true. And so there is in Scripture a great contrast between fear and faith between faith and anxiety. In fact, those issues, according to the biblical writers, are diametrically opposed. That is to say that where true faith abides, anxiety cannot. And so where anxiety or worry is prevailing, as we're going to see over this chapter, that is because it has functionally pushed out the truth. It has pushed out faith or a trust in the truth because of poor thinking. In fact, that will be, again, the great principle as we work over this passage through the next few weeks, and therefore the great principle for rightly battling worry. Getting a grip on anxiety is an issue of truth. It is an issue of the mind. It is an issue of what you're believing and trusting in when fear and anxiety once again rear their ugly heads. In fact, two times in this passage, you'll notice that Jesus overtly commands us, do not be anxious. Do not worry. Same word. And what does it imply about anxiety if you're overtly commanded not to have it? Well, it implies, evidently, that you actually possess control over it, which, of course, is so contrary to what many of the so-called experts in our day seek to proffer. If you're given a command to not be anxious, it implies you have control over it. But second of all, it implies that it's actually an issue, hear this, of obedience. It is an issue of obedience. Anxiety-free living is an issue of obedience. And so as with everything in Scripture, all of us will have a decision to make this morning from the very beginning. And that is that either Scripture will have authority in your life or something else will. Either Jesus was speaking truth or he was a liar. Either Jesus was speaking truth or Jesus was uninformed by modern theories. Either Jesus was speaking truth as God, which is why he actually expects obedience on this issue, or he was behind the times and therefore not actually God. But when you press the issue, both of those cannot be true. And many will try to make those things cohabitate. They will try to integrate, for example, modern theories with the words of Scripture. But the perspective of Jesus in this passage is that it is possible, hear this, to be anxiety-free because it's an issue of profound obedience. It's an issue of obedience, no different than any other issue of obedience. And notice he doesn't say to try and become less anxious or to find some techniques to help you cope or something like that. Rather, notice the actual gall of Jesus. He says simply just don't be. He says eliminate it. Be free of it. 
Get it out of your life. And because it's an issue of obedience, and therefore, this is the important part, an issue of true worship. The worshipful life, according to Jesus, is an anxious, free life. Now, of course, that is easier said than done, but it is nevertheless the perspective of our good shepherd. This is an issue of putting on right thinking because you've been given the proper truth to now trust in. And that is the essence of this text and what will be the essence of our weeks to come through this chapter. And so if the Bible does not work for you or what people will often say, then that is either because the Bible is not true or it is because the Bible is not holding a functional authority in your life as supreme. But if Jesus is God and the Scriptures are true and the Bible is the highest and supreme authority for life and the Bible is perfectly sufficient for everything in both life and godliness, as Peter talks about, and of course of which fear and anxiety are certainly a part, then it is upon us to then heed the words of our Lord. And where the Bible may feel insufficient, then it is upon you, and this requires a mature perspective, but then it is upon you to recognize that perhaps the issue isn't actually the sufficiency of the Word of God, and the sufficiency of it being able to accomplish everything that it says it can accomplish, but perhaps the issue of insufficiency of the Word is because of our insufficient perspective and how we're approaching the Word of God and how we're submitting our life to the Word of God in every single aspect. And so what he commands in this passage two times is, do not be anxious. Do not be anxious, verse 22 and verse 25. This is an issue of worship and obedience. This is an issue of bringing your life under the authority of God's word and God's truth. And understand that Jesus is giving these words for our good. He is our great shepherd. In fact, he calls us his little flock in this passage. This is not a command to oppress you. This is not a command to guilt you. Rather, this is a command, believe it or not, to free you. If you have eyes to see and a heart to believe. And then on top of the two commands, notice... He asks in the form of a question two more times, so why then are you anxious? Verse 25 and verse 26. Of course, implying all the more that you shouldn't be. And because he is going to give some reasons and promises for why you don't have to be. But again, all of this is going to come down every single time to what you're believing, verse 28, as to what it is you're putting your trust in as to what truth is guiding your thinking and therefore controlling your life and your hope and your expectations. If you don't have the truth of God's Word and the promises of Christ in you, then Jesus would say, then no wonder you're anxious. This was the issue with Martha. But the implication of Jesus is that if you know the truth and you understand His promises and you actually are trusting in those promises, then it cannot, fact, it cannot cohabitate with fear, worry, or anxiety. And why? Well, because it is literally unable to do so. That is his perspective as the one who has made you and holds you together, and as the one who is the designer of your life, both body and soul, I do believe that he understands how the design works better than we do. And so let's take a look at the actual text and what it is that he says here. And again, it is a wonderful passage because it is so simple and deals with a very pertinent issue. Again, last time we saw the rich fool whose issue was trying to figure out what to do with how much he had. You might remember that, but this morning Jesus goes the opposite and addresses anxiety that's produced from fear over what to do if you may not have, over not having enough, over fear of not having what you feel that you may need in the future. And frankly, all issues of anxiety can be distilled down into those two categories every single time. When you're anxious, all you have to do is ask, so am I fretting about my plans, my hopes, my desires? my dreams of how to keep, how to sustain, how to grow, how to securitize something in my life. Again, all those issues we saw last week could be a job, could be a relationship, could be money, 
could be your health, could be safety. Or is my fretting coming from the opposite? Coming from fear over what you don't yet have, over what might not yet be, or worse of all, what you fear may never actually come? Again, a relationship, money, house, career, safety, health, achievements. If your anxiety is coming from the former, just go back and listen again to last week about getting an eternal perspective. Again, there is nothing that we have, there is nothing that we have achieved that we're actually going to get to keep. So why fret? Why worry over trying to figure out how to keep it? When life is over, none of that will have actually mattered. That is what we saw. But if it's the latter, that is that you're anxious over perhaps what you don't yet have, or worried if you're still going to have it when you need it in the future, then the words of Jesus here this morning will now speak to that very important issue. And so let's take a look at what he says here. And again, it is very simple. Let me, in fact, give you the outline through verse 31 for those of you who like notes or structure. In verses 22 through 23, we're going to see command number one. Command number one, 22 through 23. In verses 24 through 26, we'll see consideration number one. Consideration number one, 24 through 26. And the next time, Lord willing, in verses 27 through 28, we'll see consideration number two. Consideration number two. And then in 29 through 31, we'll see command number two. And so command, consideration, consideration, command. And I give that all to you because the structure here helps us actually to understand the nature and meaning of this passage. Notice the two commands frame out the passage and then the truth of the promises, which are supposed to fuel those commands, are seen in the considerations. And then all of that, of course, hangs on that very important issue of a true and abiding faith, which sits right there in the center at verse 28. Again, that is the central issue. All of this comes down to the content of what it is that you're believing moment by moment in your life. When you feel anxious, the question to ask is, what am I believing? That is always the question. What unmet expectations have I perhaps put on God? What unmet expectations have I put on myself? What has God actually said, and is that truth controlling my thinking? That will be the strategy of Jesus for getting a grip on anxiety. This is about trusting the truth. And so let's take a look, first of all, at command number one, verse 22. Command number one, and again, we're only going to be in the first command and then the first consideration today, up through verse 26. I had intended to cover all of it, but I am who I am. So notice again what Jesus says. He says, and for this reason I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, nor for your body as to what you will put on, for life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Now, this, of course, is what sets up the entire passage, these two verses. And so notice he gives the command not to worry. Again, the Greek term here for anxiety. And then he breaks that down into two further categories, the first one regarding that which you eat, and then the second one regarding that which you put on. In other words, put them together. What is it? It is, in other words, the essentials for life. Now, of course, the essentials include far more than just food, just clothing, but he uses these two categories to encompass the essentials for life. In other words, the focus here is upon temporary need. That is the issue. Will God care for my needs? Is he aware of my needs? Will he deliver to me what is necessary? This is the issue. And so notice how he sets this up. Why is it that you don't have to be anxious well, again, to begin, notice he says, first of all, that life is far more than food and clothing. It is far more than food and clothing. In other words, as one man said on this, you are far more than just a simple eating machine or some kind of mannequin. Your life is far more than just working to eat and then eating to work. In fact, the term life here is the term that we often translate as soul. It's a wonderful term because... It's a term that references that immaterial aspect of a person, that you are far more than just merely physical, far more than just an animal who lives to survive but then survives to live. In other words, the command to not be anxious is a command that is built off the fundamental understanding, hear this, that you have a divine purpose. You have a divine purpose. You have, in other words, meaning. 
You have a profound reason for being, he says. In other words, to put it simply, God has made you for something, and it is far more than just physical, far more than just temporary survival, temporary issues. It is far more with what is right in front of your face in the here and the now, that issue that is bringing so much paralysis. And so fundamentally, why are so many so anxious? Why are so many so fearful, so depressed even? Why are so many just sort of floating through life with no goal, no purpose, no meaning, no mandate upon their life, no calling, no sense of anything? Well, because they don't understand the critical reason for why it is that they have been created in the first place. And so they keep trying to figure out life but without reference to the designer. In fact, this is why people without a biblical worldview are ultimately of zero help in dealing in any significant or substantial way with the issue of anxiety. The best that they can do is just try and develop some kind of technique to help manage, and usually just for a little while. Figure out a way to help numb you to your feelings of aimlessness or lostness. It's just escapism. It's just numbness. But every single one of us exists for far more than just the temporary self. That is the biblical worldview, and that is how Jesus here, understand, begins this entire discussion. He says that life, or that which constitutes your soul or your essence, or your reason for being is far more than just some temporary issue or pursuit of today. Those myopic, anxious struggles of today. In fact, find a society where self focuses on the rise, which, by the way, is the absolute essence of this culture, is it not? It's all about yourself, your self-health, mental health, emotional health, physical health, self-pursuits, me, 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 self, self, self. That is so myopic. And that is such a bad approach from a biblical perspective. Find a society where self-focus is on the rise and you will always find a society where anxiety is on the rise. And why? Well, because the biblical perspective is that you are a creature who has been endowed with a soul and the purpose of your soul, in other words, the totality of your life, in other words, both body and soul, is to focus upon and then glorify your maker. He's what's at the center of this. Or as Psalm 139 says, you have been sewn together by your maker for a purpose, and that purpose is him. Your purpose is to live for him. And so if you don't understand what that purpose is, Jesus says that you will be anxious. And if you ignore your designer, your only hope is numbness, anxiety management. This is where it has to begin. You were not created for self. You were not even created just for the good of society. Rather, you were created for God. You are His creature and you were made for Him. In other words, if I could sum up Jesus' point with this first verse, this entire issue has to begin with the critical perspective of training your mind through the Word of God to get your eyes off of self and onto Him. This is His world. This is His design. This is His creation. This is His order. And so it is upon all of us, therefore, to rightly orient ourselves within His creation. And our orientation is not to be on self, it is to be on Him alone. That is what you've been created for. And I don't have the time to develop this in full here, it is not the scope of this passage necessarily, but every single one of you are unique and you are a creation of God made in His image. But what you have to understand about that is that at the center of creation, again, is not actually us, it is Him. You exist for Him. He does not exist for us. We don't even exist ourselves for us. And so the only way to understand the purpose of your existence is to understand your life first and foremost, but with reference to your Maker. 
And because in his design, there is no meaning for you apart from him, understand that. Isaiah 43, verses 6 or 7 says, Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made, you were made for him. You exist for his purposes and his glory. Why do so many people feel so utterly lost in this world, even many Christians? Well, because they live their life with no consistent, functioning, working thought of God before their eyes. And in the context of Luke chapter 12, no working thought of Christ in His kingdom and how it is you're now to function within that, with a new purpose and a new mission and a new identity, and therefore a whole new way of life and approach to this life. In other words, let me make this simple. What Jesus is saying in verses 22 through 23 is that there must be a divine priority in your life. That is what he's saying. There's to be a divine priority and focus to your life, and it will not be found in the pursuits of the here and now. Rather, it is utterly bound up with God and His mission and His kingdom. That is what we've been seeing in Luke. And that is certainly true for you if you're in Christ. And so command number one, Jesus says, do not be anxious. Why? For your life involves far more than just existing for the temporary. Living for the moment, surviving for the moment. And I tell you the truth, and, and many of you know this, but when you do live for Him, and when you're seeking His purposes, and you're seeking, of course, all of His goals for your life, as you learn more and more of what that is through His Word, life then has a way of becoming profoundly meaningful for you, profoundly rich, profoundly substantial and satisfying and joyful, even in the difficult things. And why is that the case? Well, because you're living for something beyond yourself. A myopic focus is always the source of anxiety. And now notice he gives two illustrations to make the point and we're going to just take a look at the first one this morning. In other words, this is why you can and actually should trust Him for every provision of your life in every single way. And so in 26 through, or 24 through 26, He illustrates why you can trust Him for something like food, though, of course, life is, is far more than just food, as He says. And then in verse 27 through 28, He illustrates why you can trust Him for clothing or just any other need that you may have. In fact, it's an argument here from the lesser to the greater. The idea here is that if he provides for basic things like food and clothing, then how will he not also provide for everything else? And so first of all, notice here consideration number one. And the point again is very basic. Notice what he says, verse 24, he says, so consider the ravens for they neither sow nor reap they have no storeroom nor barn, and yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than birds? Now, again, he is talking here to some good Jews. And so understand that ravens, according to Mosaic law, were considered to be unclean. And so Jesus says that if your Father in heaven provides for every need of every bird and the kind that are even useless to you, then how much more will he provide for you, you who have incredible value because you are useful and useful for the kingdom? And I like this one because, just as I said a few weeks ago, when some of you are feeling anxious, and notice, this is literally a command from Jesus. Again, notice the word consider here. It's written in the imperative mood, which means that it's a command. But when you're feeling anxious about something, whatever it is, the Lord here is literally instructing you to go outside and look at a bird. This is what he's doing. And why? Well, because birds are not anxious. Just watch them sometime. In fact, they are so anxious free that they don't even store up things for tomorrow. You will never find a bird building a barn to store something. A second nest on the side. In fact, do you know that every aspect of God's creation does exactly what it was designed to do, except for that one aspect that bears His very image, us? When was the last time that you saw a bird fretting or wringing its wings together? When's the last time that you heard an ant murmuring or complaining or being anxious because you kicked over its hill again? 
They don't do that. They just go about their existence doing everything that they were designed to do with everything that God has given them to do it with. In fact, do you know that we are that only aspect of God's creation that actually believes for whatever reason that something is owed to us? In fact, if you want to get at the true heart of anxiety, this is it. That even the smallest prospect that something may not come about or that God might not provide something for us that we're believing that we're owed, we become tremendously anxious, we become worried. And again, what is anxiety? Well, anxiety results always from some unmet expectation (laughs) where we've come to expect something that's not actually been promised to us. And because what we have forgotten is the only thing that we're actually owed from a biblical perspective, beloved, is judgment. That's all we're owed. In fact, just think about something that you're wanting right now. I don't know what it is, but I know that you do. It could be even a good thing, a job, health, house, a relationship, some kind of plan that you're pursuing, doesn't really matter. But you're anxious right now because you haven't yet figured it out or you haven't yet attained it. And yet what we fail to remember when that happens is that if you don't have it right now, it is because in the sovereign determination of your good Father, hear this, you are not actually supposed to have it right now. You're not. And so much so that if you did have it right now, it would not be a good thing. And why? Well, because your good Father in heaven will always provide what you need, but exactly when you need it. Exactly when you need it. And so that you don't have it right now means that God has seen it fit, good, for you not to have it. And we say, well, how is this good? This is miserable. And maybe it is miserable. But just because it's miserable does not mean that it's not good. Well, how's this good? Well, because, as we see often in the Scriptures, God is far more interested in your holiness than He is in your happiness, right? And what is always good is our holiness. And sometimes the way that we achieve holiness is by learning to trust God for the unknowns in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of having no idea of how to figure this out. That is often how he develops holiness in us. And so to be anxious, say you don't have whatever it is that you're desiring right now is to live in a state of profound mistrust in that truth. More than that, it's to say functionally that we know better than God. Yeah, but doesn't God say that a job or a good health or... Having a spouse is a good thing. Well, yeah, of course those are good things. Hear this. But they're good things when he has determined they're good things. And until he's determined it, it is not a good thing. And so you don't need it. Because if you needed it, you'd have it. But what we'll often do then is, and see if this is true for you, but what we'll often do is we'll then begin to take things into our own hands, right? This is what we do. We become like Abraham who was promised a son, and when he didn't get his son in his timing, what did he do? Well, he thought it'd be wise and a good thing to sleep with his wife's slave, achieve that son for himself. But that wasn't God's plan. And it just turned into more misery. He did not wait on God. He did not trust in God's timing. And so in his idolatry, driven from anxiety and fear, because he was getting older and his wife, Sarah, through whom the son was to come, was well past childbearing age. But in his idolatry, he took matters into his own hands. What did he do? He tried to attain a good thing, but through sinful means. And we're no different Our anxiety, our lack of trust gets us into so much trouble. And then that, beloved, is always where the self-destruction begins to come in. The spiraling begins to take place, one anxious, bad decision after another. 
But what we need to do in those moments is just simply cease from striving and just go and look at a bird. A bird is fed every single day right on time. They do not sow, they do not reap, they never store away, and yet God perfectly provides for them, does He not? And so they're never anxious. Now, we're not birds, if you didn't know. And so this is not a command to not sow. It's not a command to not reap or to not steward your life well. But it is a command to observe the attitude. That's what's going on here. When you are doubting your creator, just go and look at his creation. If he perfectly cares for everything that is less valuable than you, then how much more will he care for you? You who have tremendous value, he says. And so I'm not a mystical person, you know that. And so you'll never hear me say that you should go out into the woods somewhere to learn of God or experience God or to see God or something like that. Rather, you will only discover God and the truth of God through His self-disclosed revelation, which is through the Word of God alone. But in this case, notice, the Word of God tells you to go into creation. And so when you're feeling anxious, you can turn to the Word of God always, but then here the Word of God says, turn to the bird. Turn to even the most worthless of bird, to the unclean raven, who is perfectly cared for. And then remind yourself through that living illustration that God cares for you, and He will care for you. And again, the critical issue here will be in verse 28, which is that very important concept of trust. The anxiety will only cease if you're truly believing the promise. Simple reality of the Scriptures is that truth always drives out falsehood, right? Darkness cannot abide where there is light. And so in every moment of anxiety, understand that that is resulting, whether you know this or not or believe it or not, but understand that that is resulting from believing some kind of lie, a lie that He won't provide for you or a lie that maybe you're owed something. And so he says, go to the bird, go to the raven, and remind yourself of truth. How much more will he care for you? And then notice what he says in verse 25. He says, and which of you by worrying, again, Mary Manao being anxious, can add a single hour to his life? If then you cannot do even a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? Now he appeals here to divine sovereignty and providence. That's what this is. In fact, that issue will be the great foundation upon which the rest of this chapter is built. What he's saying to these Jews, who again would have understood that concept very well from the Old Testament, this was profoundly their worldview, but what he's saying is that either God is in control or God is not in control. Either God is in control or you're in control. And this is where we begin to get at the heart of this issue and what it is that we're actually trusting in. He says that since none of us possess the ability to even add a single hour to our life, then obviously that testifies to the fact that you're not in control. That is the argument. None of us determined when we were born. None of us can add even a single hour. And so how much less can we determine and have control over anything in between? And yet, it is in that in-between time that we come to believe that we're actually in control. In our pride, in our arrogance, we think that we're something. We think that we're owed something. We think we actually hold the right to determine our reason for being, when in reality, every breath that we take is one in which we're utterly dependent upon God who holds our lungs together and gives to us life and breath and all things. We're not in control. We don't hold the divine privilege for determining anything in this life. The fact is either God is God or you are God. You are your own God. But I tell you the truth, when you come to grips with that truth, the truth that God is actually God, it is the most freeing and stabilizing truth in the universe. The challenge is just being able to believe that moment by moment, right? 
That is always the challenge. When you come to grips with the fact that God determines literally every little minutia in your life, it has a profound way of causing you to be able to just take a breath. In fact, what is providence? Divine providence? Providence is God providing for you, hence providence. But it's Him providing for you, but in His way and in His timing and for His purposes. Providence is God moment by moment holding everything together and keeping it moving. Providence is God orchestrating a million different natural details that are all happening independent of one another, but so that at the exact right time, they all come together perfectly, but to bring about His singular purpose. Providence is God superintending His control over every action and every event, but to effect a predetermined plan in your life. And the complexity of that is unbelievably staggering and just not even worth thinking about, really in any significant way. But the bottom line is that he is aware of every single detail in his creation. Do you know that? And so certainly your life. And not only is he aware of it, but he actually orchestrates all of it so that nothing that happens happens apart from his predetermined will. And his sovereign, predetermined will, understand, always comes about every single time, without exception. And exactly how he intends for it to happen. And because, understand, that is what it means to be God. That's what it means to be the maker and sustainer of everything. And that is happening all the time, in every event, in the universe, every microsecond, without fail and without exception. Total control from the spinning of massive planets to the tiniest little sparrow falling out of the sky to the ground, Matthew chapter 6, to a raven getting food, to people meeting, to the opening and closing of the womb, to every rogue molecule about to cause cancer in the body. He knows it, he orders it, he sustains it, and he is in total sovereign control over it. In other words, he is God. Proverbs 16 and verse 9 says this, and just think about this with reference to your life and why it is that you may be anxious at times. But it says, a man's heart plans his ways. That's just life, right? Always planning, always hoping, always setting a course. And again, that might be a good thing. In fact, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. We have to plan. We have to make decisions. We have to set a course. We have to order certain things in our life. But he says here, a man plans his way, but then here's this, but, contrast, the Lord determines his steps. What is the cause for anxiety at times? Sometimes it's because we've made some plans. We have set a course. We have figured something out. We have arrived at some kind of hope. Other times, perhaps, it's because we've turned a morally neutral desire into an expectation, which in many cases, if we're honest, just blossoms into idolatry. Because again, somewhere along the way, we began to believe that we were somehow owed that thing. But then when God providentially determines the path to be something different, which of course alters that course completely and changes our plans and our outcomes, we become anxious or angry or depressed. We get anxious because we're actually believing that our plan was better, which means then that we're not actually trusting His good providence. And so when our will goes up against His, we'll always be anxious because He's going to win. He always wins. So we can make all the plans that our heart desires, and they can, again, even be good desires, especially in the beginning. But in the end, God's sovereign providence determines always the outcome and the means to that outcome. Every single step. 
And what you're believing about God in that moment will be determinative as to whether or not you become anxious. And because if God is God and God is good, and this is what he's determined as for your life and as your good father, the only cause for anxiety then from a biblical perspective is when we sinfully refuse to believe that he's good. That is actually the source of anxiety. And so a man plans his way, but the Lord determines the steps. The key there is just learning to trust that what he has determined is good, which means you must know his character and his nature. Here's another one on Providence, Proverbs 16 and verse 33 says that the lot is cast into the lap, but every decision, hear that word, every decision is of the Lord. So you can do something like roll some dice, but even what those die land upon, God has sovereignly determined. There is no such thing as luck. There is only divine providence. Even in the hard things, Amos chapter 3 and verse 6 if there is a calamity, the term ra'ah in the Hebrew, literally evil, if there is a calamity in the city, hear this, has not the Lord done it? Not even a calamitous thing like a tsunami or a mass genocide as we're going to see in Luke chapter 13 or some kind of disease. None of that happens, beloved, unless God has decreed it in His providence but to effect His good purpose. That is the sovereign providence of God. In His sovereign will and ability to bring all natural events together in His timing, He does it all by His power and all of it for His predetermined purpose. And that might sound like an unbelievably frightening thing to you, and frankly it should if you're not a Christian, because you are utterly not in control and you stand in opposition to God. But what is so helpful about coming to grips with this very important truth is that if you are His child, that is, if you are in Christ and you've put your faith in Him, then God's sovereign providence is always, every single time, hear this, employed for your good. For your good. Never for your harm, but only for your good. Romans 8, 28 says, He is working all things for your good, whether you believe that or not, He is. Romans 8, 28, and we know that God causes all things. So there's that idea of providence, bringing all these things together, working in 10,000 micro details all at once, bringing them together. So God causes all things. And again, I would be unfaithful to point out how much is all. Thank you. We know that God causes all things to work together, but for what purpose? For good. So not for evil, not for your frustration, not to keep you in check, not because he's willy-nilly and doesn't actually have a plan, but for good. And then here it is, for whom? For those who love God. For those who are called according to his purpose. God works His providence over every single person and every single thing, but the only ones for whom He's working it together for the purpose of good are for those who love Him, His children. And so again, He is under no obligation at all to provide for those who are not His children. A father is not obligated to provide for a child who is not His, but a father is deeply obligated to provide and seek the good of those who are His. And so since God is sovereign and omnipotent in His providence, that, he is, that is to say He is all-powerful and actually possesses the ability to do this, then there will never be an occasion in your life in which something that is happening isn't happening for your good. Not one event, one circumstance. And because, again, how much is all? But of course, the question always comes down to the critical issue of do you believe that, right? That is always the issue. Show me an anxious Christian and I'll show you a Christian who in that moment is not believing that truth. They're not trusting or resting in that. They're Martha, 
who loved the Lord, by the way, but their Martha anxiously fretting, figuring out how in the world to accomplish it themselves. And so what they need to do is reorient their thinking and exercise self-control to bring their thoughts into, the line, into line with ultimate truth. In fact, that will be the great key or a great key to anxiety-free living. It is learning the discipline of self-control over your thoughts and over your emotions. Show me a person controlled by the truth. Show me a person even loving the truth of the sovereignty of God, and I'll show you a person who's able to drive out anxiety. I'll show you a person who can cast away worry because it's a person who understands fundamentally that they're not actually in control and that they never were. And so for people who don't have any control over when they were born or even that they were born, nor do they have an ability to add even a single hour to their life, then how foolish and silly is it, Jesus says, to fret over anything in between? What we need to do is learn to have control over the only thing that we have control over, which is what we're thinking, our own thoughts, our own emotions. Emotions aren't a bad thing. Emotions are perfectly natural. God designed them and they're good. The key is just don't let them control you. You control them. And you do it by bringing your thoughts into the line of ultimate truth, God's truth. And so notice then quickly verse 26, he says, if you then cannot do even a very little thing, that is add even a single hour to your life, then why do you worry about other matters? It is always a very good question to ask when you're in the moment of anxiety, when you're cast in the throes of worry. I mean, literally train your heart, again, through self-control to ask yourself that question. Why do you toil? Why do you worry? Why do you fear? Why do you become so anxiety-ridden? The reality is either God is in control or He's not. And if He's not, then you should be worrying because then it means that you're supposed to do something about it. And you can't add even a single hour to your life. But if he's in control, then what is the purpose of worrying? That is the question. I'm going to end it here and we'll pick it up next time, Lord willing, through verse 31. But this is such an important truth to drive down deep into your heart. It is the truth of God's sovereignty and His divine providence that steadies the anxious soul. Again, either God is in control or He's not. In fact, that is often what I say to myself if I find myself prone to worrying for something. Either God is in control or He's not. What do I believe? And when you worry or you find yourself in that pit of anxiety, that is a time to ask yourself again, what do you actually believe? What do you believe? Is this just intellectual knowledge or is this ultimate reality? If it's ultimate reality, bring your life and your decisions and your actions in line with truth. Self-control. And if it's reality and He is sovereign, then no amount of fretting can change anything. No amount of trying to be your own sovereign can affect His sovereignty. But if He's not sovereign, then it is up to you to try to have to be, which ironically, is always what we're doing when we're feeling anxious. We're believing that we're sovereign and in control. And so next time we'll look at this concept from a little bit different perspective in verses 27 through 31, and then hopefully look at some of Paul's words on this issue. He gives some very helpful words and has some very important things to say. But Jesus begins the whole discussion here with the nature of God's sovereign providence. That is the ground upon which you must stand if you are to get a grip on anxiety. And not just that God is sovereign merely in the sense that He's just some all-powerful deity out there somewhere and He's orchestrating all the affairs of the world from a perspective of indifference. Rather, you must also understand that He is sovereign, but He is 
your sovereignly good father. You must remember that he is your good father who has literally obligated himself to care for you. And he is always faithful to his promises. And he's promised to do so until your final breath. What is the cure to anxiety? Well, we're certainly not done, but it just begins here. But first of all, it begins by understanding your divine priority. That is, that you have profound purpose, you have a profound meaning as a redeemed child of God. You have a mission, you have a mandate, you have been obligated to give your life to Him in the pursuit of the kingdom, much of which we'll talk about next time. But second of all, all of that is built on the critical truth of divine sovereignty. And He is providentially determining everything in this life for your good. Everything in your life is being orchestrated by a loving, compassionate, gracious, all-seeing, all-knowing Father. He knows your need. He knows why you need it. He knows when you need it. He knows when you need it better than you think you know when you need it. And so our only job is to just trust. First step to anxiety-free living is to simply recognize who God is and who you are before Him. But then ask yourself that very important question that Jesus asks, which is, so if that is true, then why do you worry? Why are you fretting and anxious? Perhaps, and only you can answer this, but perhaps it is because you know the truth of God intellectually, but you've not yet come to believe it from your heart moment by moment. Moment by moment. If God is not your sovereign, providential Father who's given to you a purpose and created you for a cause, then you are just a highly developed animal hurling through the universe on a rock with no purpose, no goal, no meaning. And so you better find out a way real fast to get a grip, to get some control. But if you don't believe that, because frankly, that is insane, but you're still anxious then perhaps trying to be in control is the great error of what you've been doing all along. What do you believe? That is the question. What do you believe about God? What do you believe about this world? And what do you believe about yourself before Him? Creature to Creator. That is where it has to begin. And so again, this is just some introduction, but then next time, Lord willing, we'll develop these thoughts a little bit further.